Welcome to EPG Pathshala and today we are going to go to another realm of learning that is geopolitics of resources. I am Dr. Seema Mehra Parihar, teaching resource geography for last 30 years, I have got PhD in natural resource management, I have done my postdoctorate from ITC Netherlands and this is one topic which came lately into my purview when I realized and of course carrying on forward the Zimmermann's model that resources are not they become. So let's today learn under resource geography, geopolitics of resources. The learning objectives are number one, to understand the meaning of geopolitics, what is it? And also we'll be able to establish the relationship between resources and geopolitics. Also, we'll also be able to classify resources from geopolitical perspective and above all, we'll be able to list some resource disputes and which are so relevant when it comes to resource management, which we realize. Of course, they are dynamic, but we would definitely like to know how dynamic and who intervenes. So the key words are geopolitics, imperialism, hypothetical resource and geopolitical strategy. Let us understand geopolitics. If all this while when you've done resources, we have said the word that's important and the person who's very important is Zimmerman. Out here in geopolitics, the most important person who we have to remember is Jelan. K-J-E-L-L-E-N, Jelan. He's a Swedish citizen and he was the first who coined the concept of geopolitics in 1899. He defined it as the theory of the state as a geographical organism or phenomena in space. And this definition contains two elements that are crucial within the concepts of geopolitics power. Number one, the influence, politics, and another very important, which we all geographers just relish, that space. So the central role for the state as only powerful entity is very typical for the definition of Jelan, which he gave way back in 1916. Saul Bernard Cohen, another man who we all have to remember when we talk of geopolitics, he said, Geopolitics is the analysis of the interaction between, on the one hand, geographical settings and perspectives and on the other hand, political processes, all those political processes which are happening around you, both geographical setting and those political processes which of course we all realize are dynamic and each influence and is influenced by the other. I hope you all will agree to that. Geopolitics addresses the consequences of these interactions. So the definition focuses on the dynamic interaction between power and space. Do you see a connect here between resource geography and the resources, which again we all realize when we look at the Zimmerman, that resources are not they become, and it's a dynamic concept. And similarly out here in the geopolitics, there are all dynamic interactions which are happening in space. And Colin Flynn, another person in 2006 said that extensively in case if we all talk about the concept of geopolitics, he noted that power is the center of definition of geopolitics, power. Geopolitics, the struggle over the control of spaces and places focuses upon power. In 19th and early 20th century, geopolit geopolitical practices power was seen simply as the relative power of countries in foreign affairs. And in the late 20th centuries, we find the definitions of power were dominated by a focus on a country's ability to wage war with other countries. However, recent discussions of power have become more sophisticated. So I hope you all will agree. And even around you, that is happening, isn't it? Whoever is powerful is the one who is wanting to extend his or her space. Should we do it or should we not do it? Should country do that or should country not do that? But they're doing it and they're so relevant in constructing a neutral stuff to become a resource. Colin Flint again highlights, so how should we define geopolitics in the contemporary world? And with the intent of offering a critical analysis, our goals of understanding and analyzing and being able to critique world politics require us to work with more than one definition. And that's what Flint said. Webster Dictionary defines geopolitics as a study of the influence of such factors as geography, economics, and demography on the politics and especially the foreign policy of a state. A governmental policy guided by geopolitics and a combination of political and geographical factors relating to something, something like, you know, it could be a state, it could be a resource, it could be a territory, and that's something which is so very important for us to understand. The Penguin Dictionary, which we all have been reading, defines this as 
a method of studying foreign policy to understand, explain, and predict international political behavior through geographical variables. And these, of course, in variables which we all know so well, climate, topography, demography, uh, natural resources, and applied science of the region being evaluated. Evans defined this as that. So then that means what do we understand? We understand that geopolitics is diverse, is interconnecting a lot many things, but above all, what is important is also the power dynamics which are there. So let's now understand the concept of geopolitics. Jelon was a Ratzel student and he elaborated the organic concept of state and evolved the term geopolitics. He became the first to coin the term. So in case if I ask you who is the first person who coined the term, of course you all know it, it's Jelan. He gave the theory of geopolitics that fuels on expansionism. The expansionism was linked to the inherent nature of the state. State as a living form, published in 1960, outlines five key concepts that would shape German geopolitics. Reich was a territorial concept consisting of raw uh, and strategic military shape. Warp was a racial concept of the state, and Horschel was a call for autarky based on land, formulated in reaction to the vicissitudes of international market. Deschelos was a social aspect of national organization and cultural appeal. Dylan, anthropomorphizing interstate relations more than Ratzel, and also Regering was a form of government whose bureaucracy and army would contribute the people's passivation and coordination. So that means social, physical, all those were combined in it. Jelen talked about the synthesis between the society and state. He viewed state as a product of a society, but the society is no difference from state. The state has a responsibility for law and order and also to prevent the state from external dangers. I hope you all will agree to it. But besides this, According to him, state has a welfare role to play for the progressive development of society. So the welfare role was, in, was definitely told in a much more stronger way. Autocarry for Jelen was the only solution for the economic well-being of society. He emphasized that import will not lead to well-being. Remember, import will not lead to well-being and that it has to be reduced for the welfare of the society. Because society that was there was within the near wherever you are there. So the sphere of influence just limited to some space. And if you're importing, you are not constructing something which is so much for the welfare of the society. The three characteristics of the state according to Jelan were, number one, topopolitic, number two, physiopolitic, and the third was morphopolitic. So now what all these are? So geopolitical thinking from nationalistic and aggressive viewpoints produced much work in mapping new states and world orders. One of the most famous is the anonymously published book, Germania Triumphants, which described the expected global conflict as early as 1895. So that means there were global conflicts which have been mapped where one territory has invaded in other territories, and this has been published. And this is something which is recorded by Santner in 1989. In this utopian war scenario, after its assumed beginning in 1903, first allied Germany and Italy defeat France. The result was what? The result was the new political map of Europe. And it is no secret that geographers were active members of imperialist circles. For example, in 1890, Ratzel founded a political party with enormous imperialistic aims, including the maintenance of the dream of a great German empire. But what I want you to all remember, you all, that means the geographers, the ones who are listening to this lecture, were once upon a time right in the close circle whenever we are talking about extending our land or our territory, our state boundaries, geographers were a very important part of it. And of course, in resources, they are a very important part. The geopolitical paradigm changed during the 19th century because of that. From natural boundaries as contributing to the peace of nations to a resilient paradigm of the struggle between expanding territories with war as natural mechanism in the struggle for space. I like to reread this line because this is very important. There was a shift. What was this shift? 
the shift was from natural boundaries as contributing to the peace of the nations to a resilience paradigm of the struggle between expanding territories. So it was natural boundaries versus expanding territories. Isn't that something happening now also? St to stabilize the peace, the term proposed by Kenneth implies removal of all probably cause of conflicts. It is no geographic accident that the rhetoric of geopolitical peace coincides with the zone of wealth and surplus. So what are we today greedy about? Zones of wealth and surplus. Don't you remember Mahatma Gandhi also, the ones who said we have enough for man's need, but not for man's greed. So the moment we talk of the natural boundaries or the other boundaries we talk about, what has happened is the greed is the one which is of course same as expanding your territory to accumulate wealth and to have surplus. Let us now understand establishing the relationship between resources and geopolitics. It is important to consider that the population of a state, its efficiency and effectiveness without at the same time discussing the natural resources which are available for its use is just not possible. People must have land on which to live and to grow their food. Don't you agree with it? We need to have land. We need to have a small place where we can grow our food and that's something which is a basic necessity. Besides this, and almost all human food is derived directly from the soil and its volume and quality depend directly on the extent and nature of the soil. Of course, we all understand that. Food is important. The cultivable soil must then be regarded as primary resource in the estimation of national power. Beneath the soils are minerals and some of these are important for human welfare and essential in national defense. A state which lacks the most important minerals or which has only small reserves may feel especially vulnerable, isn't it? Of course, vulnerability starts if you do not have that particular piece of land which has a very fertile soil because you can't grow food on it. So in order to be considered military power potential of the state, the resources must be developed and pounds recognize this. So it's important for us to recognize the potential of the resources on every territory. Thus we find the cause and effect relationship between A resources, B their development and C the power potential and a state with a higher degree of desirability of resource mobilization and development acquires definitely a greater amount of economic strength. I hope you, uh, you agree with it. So that means desirability of resource mobilization is very important. And because that helps you in having bigger economic strength. Economic strength, as Adhikari said, economic strength has always been an instrument of political power. Today also, in case if you look around at a very micro level, you all will agree, the one whoever is rich, whoever has money, whoever has a big uh, infrastructure, handy to him, is the one who's called a who is called a powerful person. And same is the concept at the macro level. Stephen B. Jones defined resources within the context of geopolitics as follows. What does he say? He said, anything a nation has, can obtain or can conjure up to the support strategy for resources are as tangible as soil and as intangible as leadership as measurable as population, as difficult to measure as patriotism. So that means what are the key words to recognize here? The key words to recognize here are number one, tangible, in the moment you think of tangible, they are resources. And the moment you think of intangible, they are leadership and patriotism, feeling, all these are difficult to measure or to quantify. So after understanding that basic principles, and understanding the link of resources and uh, geopolitics or for that matter power dynamics. Let us now get into the second part and let us understand resources and the politics of power. Do they have any connection? Of course, global power shifts in the post cold war era have characteristically moved away from traditional military rivalries to economic expansion and prowess and we all recognize this. The paradigm in part fueled by technological advances and the ferocious scale of globalization in recent decades has highlighted the strategic advantages 
especially lent in particular by natural resources. That means whoever has more natural resources definitely has a higher strategic advantage and we need to recognize this. Historically, we can see that a lot of conflicts like prolonged conflicts and civil wars in parts of Africa, Latin America and Asia were there because we had different places with different type of natural resources. Natural resources such as hydrocarbons, gold, uranium, diamonds, copper, zinc and rare earth minerals are now increasingly reshaping the global geopolitical landscape and they certainly are influencing foreign policies and boosting economic growth engines across continents. I hope you will all agree to this that what we need are we need more resources in case if we want to have a great foreign policy and that will definitely boost the economic growth and that is something which is happening and which you all recognize also. Just close your eyes to when you are listening to this and just try to see in case if you can see any country where the economic growth is expanding and that is expanding because why? That country is rich with natural resources but there is something more to it. Do not you agree? And that is of course is geopolitics. Rapid industrialization, rising demand for energy, emergence of new markets and depletion of natural resources at a disconcerting rate are all adding to a growing rivalry among the nations. We all remember this that in Middle East what is the whole game power that is happening there? It is the enviable oil wealth of the Middle East which has allowed the region for over 50 years to monopolize global oil supplies, production and prices through its OPEC cartel is now a classic textbook example of how natural resources can critically mold foreign policies and forge enduring political ties. And that is something which is we all know it. The moment you think of oil, what comes into your mind? What comes into your mind is which region? Of course, Middle East and we all are seeing that so many conflicts, so many foreign policies and so many at a global level the policies are being impacted by that. Let us now take this lesson forward and take it forward uh, by understanding or asking ourselves a question that why are natural resources so relevant? They are so relevant because the hunger is also growing at one level and as the hunger for raw material and resources rises exponentially, the intricate balance between economic priorities and global political discourse is becoming even more fragile. The West's cautious approach with Iran over its controversial nuclear program is as much dictated by security concerns as economic. And of course, we all have read this in newspaper and we understand this. Tehran's looming threat to close the Strait of Hormuz is being really looked up upon. The, artil, the passage that is out of the Persian Gulf for 40 percent of the world's tanker, you know, they cross that passage. That is the reason why people are talking about why, how can this be closed? Amid, and so the pressure is building and this is something the nuclear program and can potentially derail global markets because that passage is so important, so relevant. Endowed with the world's largest natural gas reserves, Russia also enjoys a similar monopoly over regional energy trade and a vast web of pipelines network. The biggest energy supplier to Europe, Russia has often been accused of A, manipulating prices, B, fixing transit fees, C, diplomatic arm twisting to maximize political and financial gains and that will always happen because they have an edge. So, what is required now? We all need to think and we all need to see that how can you know the regions progress and we all can also think of the welfare of all. Can we or can we not is a big question. Geopolitics play a very important role and I think so we all need to recognize that. The quest for alternative sources and favorable access therefore driving many growing economies to seek political and strategic partnerships for you know and that is important. So, what are we looking for? We are looking for political and strategic partnerships far afield. They may not be my next door neighbor and they may not be with just next door neighbor. China's systematic large scale investment strategy in Africa 
a continent with vast reserves of oil, gold, coal, nickel, diamonds and copper is also we all have to note and understand the importance of it. China and Africa are just not next door neighbors. They are so far apart. But Africa is rich in these resources and China is definitely working and thinking of the future while you know investing there. Since the 80s what we find is that you know this region is the economic foresight in mind. Although contentious and often accompanying allegations of new imperialism on Beijing's part, the partnership has not only boosted growth in the world's second largest economy, but also pumped over $100 billion in jobs and infrastructural projects in the continent historically marred by conflicts, poverty and underdevelopment. So Africa on one hand was conflicts, poverty and underdevelopment, today is looming with the help of another far afield partner. Currently, Africa's largest trading partner, China, has established special economic, economic zones in Zambia, Egypt, Nigeria, Mauritius, and Ethiopia. And that's something, you know, which is noteworthy. So why is it happening? Because again, geopolitics, strategic partnership is so important. Partnerships, of course, we understand, are important. And we understand that. And we have just seen this with an example shared with you all, with China and Africa. Let us now try to understand and have a little glimpse of the classification of the resources from a geopolitical perspective. So we are going to classify the resources. Number one are power resources available immediately. And these include active coal mines and factories which are actively producing objects with immediate power potential such as steel and chemical fertilizers. Second, resources available only after activations. Among such resources would be standby equipment and would include such plants which are in standby mode. So another driver comes and it gets activated and the time required for production may vary from hours to days according to the time required to warm up. These are the power potential reserved in stock or the state. Third, what we find is resources available only after conversion. An automobile factory is one example for it. Can turn into a motor manufacturing system only when the required equipment is upgraded, technology added. Similarly, most factories producing consumer goods may turn into factories producing power equipment. That's possible. And so now we've learned three. The fourth could be resources available only after development. And can you guess? Yes. Which are the resources that are available and only after development? Yes, you guessed it right. These include fuel reserves or all deposits known to exist but awaiting uh, the opening mines or the construction of the processing units. That means all those are ones which are neutral stuff right now and are getting constructed and such development may take several years. It is not uncommon example for a coal mine to take four to five years to start operating. It is unlikely therefore that such resources would be taken in light before making any sort of political decisions. And the decision to resort to a war is most likely to be made only in the light of resources already in some phase of development. On the other hand, what we find? If the war shall last longer than the pro protagonist at first expected it to be, it's likely that resources undeveloped or underdeveloped at the instance would be exploited at the conclusion. So now we have learned these four uh, classifications. Fifth is the hypothetical resource. What do I mean by this? I simply mean by this is the coal, petroleum, ore bodies and other resources which are there whose existence is only presumed. That means they are still neutral stuff somewhere lying there but not proved can be said to have any power value. No political authorities are likely to count on them unless careful investigations has raised the resource at least to the level of supra category. So now after understanding the classification of resources, let's take our journey of this lesson and understand the importance of resources and in national strategy. So S.P. Jones makes that this discussion, he said that you know they are important because of following reasons. Number one, in the light of power inventory, national strategy interventions become important, the strategic needs of the state and within the purview of the ability of the resources. The four reasons are there which are so very important. First, the harmony of resources and national strategy. Second, the argumentation or reduction of resources by national strategy. Third, the allocation of resources in relation to national strategy. And fourth, 
the relativity of the power in light of national strategy. The discussion is necessarily based on the philosophy that so long there is politics among sovereign states, there will be estimation of power in the light of the required national strategy and the availability of the resources. Pute regions. The clear and precise boundaries between the states shown on the most political maps of the world give little hint of widespread disjunction between patterns of effective state control and the territory, territorial aspirations of the state leaders. The significance of this disjunction can be seen in the ubiquity of the interstate disputes over territorial and resources. Over the past 45 years, more than half the world's states have been involved in some kind of border or territorial disagreements. So what is important data for us to remember is that more than 50 percent, around half of the countries are the ones who are involved. And overlapping territorial claims are at the heart of many of the major interstate conflicts of the 80s, including those between Iran and Iraq, which we know it, India and Pakistan, which we have seen, Libya and Shad, Argentina and the United Kingdom, and the Israel and its neighbors. The sources have provided the means for the assertion of power of the imperialistic power. State power is centric on the resource control mechanism. During the mercantilist period of the 15th century, trade and war became intimately linked to protect or indirect the accumulation of the world riches, mostly in the form of the bullion market and the maritime transport and which must of what we find is that you know, in our minds we think that that place has more resource and we try to create a balance between that and that is the reason that adds value and then we say, oh well, this is a region of conflict. So major geopolitical disputes over resources uh, we have and one of the major resource that we can think of is water dispute and I will give you a few examples of that. The first example that I would like to give you is of South China Sea disputes. Uh, China claims the sovereignty in the South China Sea on the basis of its hegemonical power. <coughs> we have different maps, you know, which are talking about, oh, well, this is my land, this is your land. A map was released in Chinese map in 1947 and proclaims its sovereignty rights over the marine resources. China claims its sovereign right over the marine resources under the following legal basis. That's China's proclamation. The 2009 notes verbal to the United Nations Secretary General responding jointly to the submitted document by Malaysia and the Vietnam on the outer limit of the continental shelf. The 2009 preliminary information indicative of the outer limit of the continental shelf and the 2011 note verbal to the UN Secretary General responding to a Philippine note verbal. The first document provides a Chinese map with the nine dashed lines issued in 1947 in support of its sovereignty claims. But what is to be noted is, it fails to give any interpretation of it. It was simply on a map, some lines drawn, and had no interpretation. And the second document proclaims, and that's based on uh, UN clause, the island's entitlement to extend beyond the 200 nautical mile EZ and continental shelf in the East China Sea and other territorial sea areas. So, of course, the economic zone is there and we all understand the exclusive economic zone, uh, uh, the line that is there from the territory. But again, this is another region which we, we are having again not a clear understanding of the path and the area that is available. The third document as submitted in 2009 retaliates uh, China's sovereign claim over the region. In July 2012, the Vietnam National Assembly passed a law redefining Vietnam sea borders include the parcel and Spati islands in responsible to the Vietnam's move and the China State Council approved the establishment of a new uh, territory and level city of Sancha covering the parcel and the Sprati island in the same month. Let us now look at the other example. The Philippines voiced a strong protest against China's aggression action. In response to the Philippine protest, China's defense minister spokesman uh, said China will China will resolutely oppose any military provocations. So, and it continued and what we find is and what is implying is that China would be willing to use force to advance and protect its national sovereignty and territorial integrity and obviously it reflected Beijing's growing assertive posture again. And so now since 2014 what has happened is China has stepped up the construction of artificial islands over the disputed sparkly a very dangerous move maybe of course in China's favor. What it has done, it has caused an 
escalation of tension in the South China Sea and attracting widespread attention. In October 2015, the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague issued a ruling that it had jurisdiction over the case filed in 2013 by the Philippines against China's claims. But it has been boycotted by China. And all this we can read in Durfee's book and there are many other books also. So that's one dispute which you all, my advice would be all those the ones who are listening to this lecture, go and read it and see that how some countries are uh, trying to assert their power over the resources of other countries. Should it be done or should it not be done? If you get a power someday, think about it. Let's now look at the second example. That's a Tista water dispute. Tista river we all understand is the one which originates in Himalayan. Himalayan flows through Sikkim and West Bengal to merge with Brahmaputra in Assam. And this river is the most contested basin between Bangladesh and India. The river provides means of livelihood for people in Sikkim and Bangladesh. Tista is called as lifeline of Bengal. The dispute is mainly on the sharing of water between India and Bangladesh of the Tista River. Bangladesh has asked for an equitable solution for the according Ganga water treaty and we know it. What is the Tista issue? It's an agreement for the equal sharing of water on 50-50 basis was agreed by India and Bangladesh in 2013. West Bengal government has been opposing the proposal as it fears that the sharing of water to such an extent with the lower riparian country would be havoc for the state, especially in dry seasons. Tista river has an estimated annual flow of 60 billion cubic meters during the wet season and the monsoonal period, while a scant rainfall during the dry season causes problems and conflict of water share between the internal and external population of the state. And we all know it. 50-50 we say it, but is it right or wrong? Upper altitude and the lower altitude, again that creates problem. Does the issue of equitable share of water resources become the hot issue for condensation? Bangladesh has put a huge claim over the Indian government action to build uh, the Gazaldova barrage and said that this barrage is unilaterally channelizing a large volume of water on the Tista due to which the country's historic flow has been reduced to only 10% and its Tista irrigation project has suffered. The downstream location of Bangladesh is further an impediment to use the river of Tista. Further, the Indian government is trying to build 31 dams in the river basin which again is against the equitable distribution of resources. Now, uh, we are of course getting into the second example, which we all have learned till now with the Tista issue. It's an agreement for the equal sharing of water on 50-50 basis. And this was agreed by India and Bangladesh in 2013. But of course, the conflict remains. Conflict remains in what? In sharing of the water to such an extent that some people also talk about it's the upstream and downstream hegemonic relationship. Some say the construction of dams is a problem. So construction of dams result in what? Construction of dam results in the conflicts which are real, which relies because of the not equal sharing of water. And construction of barrage is another thing that creates a conflict. So all these are there and we all need to recognize and what we have learned from the last two examples of China and of India in the Tista river is that we all need and we all need to form our policies so that as much as possible there is an equitable distribution of water resource in this case and in all other cases where the construction of those 12 hydro plants which are there which Bangladesh is so angry about or there are other reasons for it is something which is so important. So now what have we learned in this lesson? We have learned in this letter that geopolitics is so very important. Zimmerman's model is there but Jelan's geopolitics is equally important for understanding of the dynamic concept of resource. There are regions with resource conflicts, there are small pockets with resource conflict and we all have learned this in this lesson. We also all have to remember and I want all of you to remember what is important is geopolitics. In the construction of resource, in the conversion of neutral stuff into a resource. All the best to all of you and enjoy using resources and as much as possible construct policies which are useful to each and around nation. Thank you very much.
Thank you.